All right, good. So we're recording. Um, so we've left the continent. If you kind of think back from our journey, right, what we've covered, covered so far, um, we left the continent. Um, we journeyed across the Atlantic, right? Last week we found ourselves in the open boat. Um, so now we're placing ourselves on United States soil, right? And we're following the transition and the migration of the African oral tradition and the African voice through these, this genealogy that we're following. Um, so think about how we've discussed and we covered language for the past two weeks, right? Um, think about how Ngugi wants to separate himself from the colon colonial language. Um, think about Patrice Mal Maladoma, Patrice Somme, having the difficulty of producing his biography um, with the English language, right? So now we're having another text that deals with language, but in a more subtle way. Um, I, I, I'm sure you guys picked up when you try to read this, um, it feels and it sounds a little bit different. It may be hard to read just because it's not written in your standard English, right? Um, if you think about what was mentioned a couple of weeks ago as it pertains to Oakland Unified School District, um, if you think about the video that we watched last week with Ryan Coogler, and we talk about that Oakland dialect and, and the use of Ebonics, um, you kind of see that play out here in the way that the novel or the autobiographical, autobiographical text is written, right? Um, a lot of broken English, um, a lot of what they may call pidgin um, type of language within the text. Um, that is done on purpose and that is all situated in, in what we've been covering so far as it pertains to this notion of language as it pertains to an identity. Um, also, what becomes a little bit more reticent in this work is just the role of stories and the impact that stories plays in as it pertains to making understanding and making sense of things. So um, I'm going to go through what I found of interest, um, touch on a little bit about Zora Neale Hurston herself. And then we'll, um, like, I, like I mentioned, we won't do the fishbowl this week. We're gonna do uh, more of a breakout group session and then the breakout groups will lead to our larger um, course conversation. Um, so the book is entitled um, Of Mules and Men. So that's the name of the book. It's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a auto, as I mentioned, it's an autobiographical text. So essentially what Zora Neale Hurston did has anybody heard of Zora Neale Hurston before this course? Anybody familiar with it? Um, Alyssa shaking her head. What, what familiarity do you have with Zora Neale Hurston? Um, I haven't read any of her works, but like in elementary and my senior year of high school, I used to do like Black History Bowls. And um, she was mentioned as um, like an affluent uh, author. So, and yes, absolutely. So she's um, one of her more famous works is Their Eyes is Watching God. Um, a really, really good novel. Um, she also is a playwright and she also does movie productions, but she's a trained anthropologist. And she was one of the first black women anthropologists of her time. And you see a lot of her anthropological work play out in the text here. Um, all right. So one of the things that, that to me was important, right, was this idea or this notion of telling um, this idea, this notion of lying, right? And then the things that are, are spoken, right? What's being spoken. And these all are components of the African oral tradition. And it really sees these um, components play out on the for opening page on 131, right? Y'all been lying, sorry, y'all been telling and lying, right? So there is a significance to this idea or this notion of lying or this idea of telling, right? And again, Think about it as, as, a, as, a, um, as a schema to help you make sense of the world, right? Um, this idea of what is folklore, right? Because this is a book where she's um, depicting and researching and transcribing folklore. So what is folklore? What's the purpose of folklore? And what does it do within a community? Um, these, uh, the, the, the idea of dad, so you hear in the story, there's two characters who they refer to as dad, right? And, and they're the elders in the community and they're the ones that are telling the story. So one, what is the role of the elders, right? And, and this notion of them being situated as dad or what they may call in the African tradition, Baba, right? Um, we have the bear, the lion and the king, right? 
And think about that story as a story of subversion, right? What, is, what do I mean by subversion How to, or to be subversive? What does that mean? Or to undermine authority, right? So think about one, if you think about the way that this was written and the language that she uses, it's, a, it's depictive of a certain time, right? So we're thinking post-enslavement, we're thinking the reconstruction period, right? So um, it's this question of African people have just now earned their liberation, they've earned their freedom, right? So it's this idea that they're still coming out of an enslaved institution, right? So the dynamics of the slave holder and the enslaved are still at, at play, right? So if you think about what follows the end of um, enslavement and you think about reconstruction, you have a lot of things like sharecropping, right? So where you may work the land that you were formerly imprisoned on to earn yourself a living or to earn some type of income, right? It's a sharecropping. So these dynamics of enslavement and enslaver are still sort of at play. So when you think about being subversive, when you think about undermining, right, authority, the stories of the rabbit, bear rabbit, we don't read bear rabbit, but that's another prevalent story within African folklore. The stories of bear rabbit, the stories of the bear, of the lion, it's a story about subversiveness, right? The ability to use your wit to overcome a challenging circumstance, right? So think about that as it pertains to that story. Um, there's a story about how to eat fish, right? The, one of the elders tells you, tells us the proper way to eat fish. What's the significance of that? Think about that in the space of knowledge being passed down from generation to generation. They also mentioned um, the wind climbing on your back. And they use that as a way to explain being cold at night, right? And he said, not even the covers can prevent you once you get that wind on your back, right? Because not even the covers can keep you from being cold. So again, think about how stories helps you make sense of the world. And in this example of the wind being on your back. Um, and then the, the story kind of ends with a preacher, right? A preacher kind of arrives on the scene, pulls out his Bible and starts reading from the Bible. And there's a particular sermon that is developed, that's delivered through him reading those passages. There's a certain story that's being told within this, story, within this sermon. Think about that story. Think about the significance of that story and what she wants us to think about in the telling of that story. So as I mentioned, she's a, um, Zornel Hurston is an anthropologist. Um, she studied under Franz Boas. He is the father or considered um, the father of American anthropology. So again, she's, no, she's nothing to sneeze at. She is a trained and seasoned anthropologist, right? So this is the work that she's doing is situated in this canon of anthropology. Um, she studied at Howard. She earned her AA at Howard. Then she went to um, Bernard College of Columbia for women's where she got her BA in anthropology. Um, and then she went on to do her graduate studies at Columbia University, where she received her graduate's degree in anthropology, and she studied under France Boas. So, um, do you guys, so when, when we talk about folk folklore, do you have a definition, a working definition for yourselves as to what folklore is? Kind of. Okay. Um, I'm gonna put that on pause. That's gonna be part of the project of your breakout groups, okay? Um, so another thing that we'll, we'll, before I do that, so just to keep in mind, you know, um, we, we, she started this book's research for this book is in 1927, okay? So this is the year that she started to go down to Florida. She started to go down to New Orleans to begin to collect these folklore. So think about the temporality. Think about the time that she's in. This is 1927, where she's going around and collecting these stories, okay? Um, so think again, um, you know, with me, I'm very big on theoretical frameworks, and this is gonna to come to play in our midterms, right? So when you answer your three or five questions, you're gonna to have to use a theoretical framework. Um, the theoretical frameworks that we covered so far is the counter, counter narrative or counter storytelling, right? That was our first theor theoretical framework. 
We also have African-American male theory, that African people are resistant and resilient with an innate capacity for brilliance. So that's our second theoretical framework. And our third theoretical framework is really situated in what we read this week, is funds of knowledge, right? Um, and again, that's knowledge that is produced from your community or your family that is meant to be passed down from generation to generation. And again, this book is a production of the funds of knowledge. You can really see that out, um, play out here in the works. Okay, so this are some points of emphasis that I extracted from the reading. Um, what we're gonna do now is um, go into our breakout groups. It'll probably be about three people, three to four people per group. Um, what you're tasked to do is discuss what you wrote in your journal, right? Discuss what you thought her thesis was. Um, discuss her method. How does she go about making you understand what her thesis is? Um, or her style, right? So the style is important when you think about how the, the book was written, right? The language that she uses. So you guys should discuss that at some capacity. Um, within that conversation also is, was it effective? Did the way that she write the book work for you? Did it make the, her message more opaque or more confusing? Or was it um, something that you found beneficial, right? So those are some, one of those, those are what you're discussing in your breakout groups. Also, how did you guys analyze this? So how did you help make sense of what you read? And of course, how does this re uh, relate to what's going on in today's society? So your three paragraphs that you wrote in your journal should be discussed amongst your breakout groups and also discuss this idea of folklore, right? What is folklore? So you should walk away with a group definition of folklore when we come back together to discuss as a class. Um, I'm gonna give you guys about 10, 15 minutes to discuss. Um, there, I'm gonna put the groups randomly, so I don't know who will be in what group, but definitely assign a spokesperson. So that way, when we come back as a class, um, we, we have one person in your group that's gonna kind of discuss what the group talked about, and then we'll open it up to a broader class discussion. Does that make sense? Is there any question or anything I need to make more clear for you guys? All right, so bear with me while I break you into the breakout group. Do uh, you guys have enough time to uh, build on the questions? Yeah, all right, cool. Um, you should be all back. All right, so I don't know who was assigned for spokesperson, um, but for group one, it, Alyssa was in the group. So whoever was the spokesperson for group one is Alyssa's group. Um, Chris's group is group two. So whoever is the spokesperson for group two has to be prepared. And then uh, George was group three. So whoever is the spokesperson for George's group um, be prepared to discuss what your group thought. Again, we have a spokespeople assigned, but it's going to be an overall clash conversation. So everyone should be engaged in the conversation. Um, so let's start with group three, whoever is the spokesperson for George's group. Um, what did you guys talk as, as it pertains to our journals? And what, what did, would you guys discuss as it pertains to this idea or a definition of folklore? And then who is the spokesperson for group three? 
Okay. Um, I was in group three, and um, so basically, Eileen, George, and I talked about um, like the meaning was like teaching like lessons, and um, Eileen brought up like the concept of like fairy tales, and like I kind of agreed with her because in like every reading we have um, kind of like every reading I have been taught like a lesson or like I've learned something new and then um, every reading kind of pertains a lot to like imagery. There's a lot of imagery shown that like it kind of like makes the story up in your mind like when you're reading something some you're kind of making sense of it and um, like kind of in summary of like our reading today we learned about um, let me pull up my reading really quick. Um, so first we taught about ah, we talked about um like the dads kind of like teaching lessons to like the younger kids and like on page 135 it talked it was a it's a quote where it says well after you wash your hand your hands is washed and the blessing is said you look at the fried fish and you don't grab it and then um now you take your fork your fork and stick straight at the fish when you done if you done chose it, choose, and yeah. if somebody asks you to take two, you say no, ma'am, and thank you. And then, um, uh, which one's it talks something about like not like choosing the fish, like picking at it, just like stabbing one, and you know. Um, so we kind of talked about how like you have to be like respectful in a sense, like when you're eating, when you're like choosing, when you're choosing stuff, kind of like saying like something like your parents are teaching you as you like grow up yeah it says um nobody with any manners or home raising don't take the fork and turn over every fish in the dish in order to pick up one in order to pick up the best mm -hmm. one yeah yeah and then um eileen mentioned how um it was on page 131 oh wait 132 um how it was now nah, you ain't oh how she said that we have to meet a certain standard in order to like kind of like what I think it was like to fit in in some sense um or to uh, how do you say like meet a certain like standard to be in a community how and the quote said it's like one of the first like the first paragraph it's a it said now you ain't no king I'm the king of the world and you can't be no king till you whip me get down and fight so um kind of like you have to meet a standard to like be up to like the level of someone like kind of like in today's day like you have to be like you have to fit like the kind of like trends and stuff just to be like to fit in it's kind of a sense i don't know okay. eileen can you like chime into that i'm like yeah, kind I of a lost <laughs> but, um basically like how like i connected that to today's world how like he was like king but they said no you can't be king because it didn't fit their standards and it's like you have to i guess with like that level you have to appease everybody but like but the question that i had like brought up is like what makes them the person like that we have to meet the standards of does that make sense yeah and, and so what what i did what i lean is, is bringing up it's a very good point right because and, and when i think about what i met, mentioned earlier around this idea of subversiveness and this notion of undermining right subversiveness and undermining all become possible when you're dealing with power right and and that comp the conforming that eileen is talking about is a conforming to power so you can't be a king unless you can whip my ass and if you can't whip my ass then you ain't no king right so that's a power play right so and, and if you think about the story he gets in a fight with the bear and what happens he has to stab the bear right so he he um the bear had him beat he had him in that bear hug so he had to use his technology to even the playing field and he stabbed him right then he comes into contact with the lion he knows he can't physically beat up the lion even though they're fighting right he says the lion bit and john bit back but what ends up happening is what 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 allowed john the upper hand the gun right so think about in a historical context right think about how colonization works right these people were even playing fields right so the europeans went into africa there were already kings in those countries right 
each ethnicity, each group had its own king. But the European came in and said, nah, I'm the king. But what happened? They had to fight that shit out. But the one with the gun is the one who was able to be the king, right? And that's the, it was the one who was able to establish their power and to establish their dominance. So yes, it's about conforming. Yes, it's about um, fitting in. Yes, it's about assimilation. But that all becomes possible through this idea or this ideation that we call power, right? So what they're talking about is how power plays out. But then how can you undermine these powers, right? Because think about the dynamics between the bear and the lion. The bear was wounded and the bear didn't want the lion to eat him, right? So what he did, so instead of to get him off of my back, I'm gonna go put him on John. Right, so he used his wit to survive. So it's about learning how to. This is this, this notion of fugitivity and maroonage, right? This notion of fugitivity comes into play as like this: when you're in a slave system, right? When your body and your life is for the production of um, for the production of profit for someone else, right? The moment you try to escape or free yourself, at that point, you're stealing. Does that, does that make sense to you guys? So if me, my person, my being is a property to someone else, right? And I try to steal my freedom or steal myself away to freedom, I become a fugitive because I'm someone's property, right? So at the minute that you decide to separate from your owner, you're stealing yourself. Does that make sense? In a slave system, in a slave society, right? So this is this notion of fugitivity to where you're always on the run from being captured and being bought back to the slave system. Has anybody seen the movie Queen and Slim? Okay, so Eileen shaking her head. Queen and Slim is, about, is a movie about this black couple that's on a date. They get into an altercation with the police the boyfriend ends up killing a cop and they are on a run for the re remainder of the movie, right? So from that standpoint, Queen and Slim are, are living fugitivity, right? Um, there's a philosopher, Fred Moten, and he talks about this idea of living without leaving a trace, right? And this, is, this is, becomes possible under the, the auspice of fugitivity. So you're running, right? And you're trying not to get cop captured, Think about the, um, they put scent bloodhounds on you, right? So they track your scent with the dogs, right? So it would literally be the case when enslaved Africans would run, they would find like hollowed out trees, especially down in Florida, down in Carolina and places like that. And they would live in the hollowed out tree, right? That's where they would spend their night. But they knew when the sun, when the sun came up and their dogs were in the, in the enslavers would be back on their trail that they needed to be out of that space by morning. So what they would do before they left, they would go and wipe up all their footprints so the dogs or the slave catchers won't see them walking to where they walk to and where they're walking towards and away from. Um, they made sure they put out all their fires and dispersed the fire material. They made sure that they clean their space as if no one was ever there, right? So living without leaving a trace. That's a production of fugitivity, right? So another part of fugitivity is being intelligent, right? One of the things, one of the ways that the enslaved Africans found freedom, what, there's a story of some brother who put himself in a box and shipped himself to the north, right? So just how we have UPS today, he got a, a big ass box, stuck, jumped in the box, wrote a note like this box is going to Canada. And they shipped the box to Canada and he got his freedom that way, right? So what's at play here is intelligence in order to be subversive. Intelligence to undermine the system of authority, right? Another way that you see that played out in the quotidian slave experience. When I say quotidian, that just means daily, right? Um, the overseer will come, on, come over and say, you know, why aren't you working fast enough? Oh, well, boss, you know, I don't know, boss, it's hot out here. They'll do things to kind of disarm them, 
right? And allow them to work slow, allow them to maybe um, dis distract their working attention to something else, right? They'll find little clever ways just to not do the work that they're supposed to do, right? They're supposed to be coming, coming home with uh, five barrels of cotton a day. They'll come home with four and a half, right? So they'll figure out ways to undermine the slave system, right? Um, if I'm in the, if I'm in the um, kitchen cooking, I might steal a couple of biscuits and, and give them to my children, right? Those are ways of undermining the slave experience. So in this story of the bear, the lion, and John, it's a story of undermining. It's a fugitive story if you think about the way that the bear and the lion plays out. So really what Eileen was attentive to she picked up on, on that underlying message. So that's a really good point. Um, did you guys give your mention of folklore already? You, you did, right? Fairy tales. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Thank you. Was there anything else you guys wanted to add from group three? No? Okay. Um, so let's jump to group two. That was Chris's group. I don't know who was the um, spokesperson, but whoever's in Chris, Chris's group and who was the spokesperson. Yeah, uh, yeah, oh, I was in group two. I'll, yeah. I'll be the spokesperson. Okay. okay, uh, for group two, we went over like we went over a bunch of things for folklore because we didn't know like exactly what it was. So we gave we went over some other things like because we w went over the story and we like they were discussing animals and stuff. And so someone thought about it, it was animals. And so I don't know if we were actually supposed to do this, but we like we wanted to Google it to get a better understanding because we mm -hmm. actually we didn't know we had all different. Uh, like suggestions on what it meant and so it actually meant how like it's stories passed down from like communities and stuff and that actually like helped us understand it more because like that's technically what it was mm -hmm. and it helped us like know that yeah it was like someone passing down stories from like person to person in like communities I guess yeah. and that's what we went over for folklore. So Chris real quick how how does that compare to my definition of the theoretical framework for today funds of knowledge? Uh, honestly, I, I wouldn't need, like, I don't even have an answer. So I wouldn't. what funds of knowledge are is a way that knowledge gets passed down within family, within community from one generation to the next. So mm -hmm. if you think about what you just provided me as a definition for folklore. How does that complement this notion of funds of knowledge? I feel like it'll complement it because like if people or like a community passes down a story, it's like, it's always going to be passed down is like, I don't, I don't know how to explain that, but like, like if someone in your community passes down a story about something that happened, like about someone great in your community, like some, that person's always going to be remembered. And like, he'll, he'll always have a place in that community or, or, the, or those people that he helped or the, like, you know. So the connection that you're articulating, Chris, is the sustaining of culture, right? Yes. Folklore, funds of knowledge, it helps to sustain a culture. It helps to leave the imprint of that culture on the memory of the members of that culture, right? Because what he's saying is, if you tell that story, it will always be remembered, right? Mm -hmm. So again, that's a way to sustain the culture. So let me tie that back to my previous comment, right? If you think about undermining, if you think about being subversive, right? Folklore becomes important because if you're in a circumstance to where your culture is being stopped out and it's being violently beat out of you, mm -hmm. the way to remember and the way to remain that and maintain that culture is through folklore, right? They can't beat those memories out of you. They can't beat those stories out of you, right? So that's where this folklore and these uh, funds of knowledge become important in a colonial society, in a slave society, and in, a, in an oppressive society, right? Um, a funds of knowledge or folklore within the black community would be, you have to be twice as good, right? That's something that my mom told me that she heard from her mom, that her mom heard from her mom, that I'm telling my children, because what that says is, because of your epidermis, because of the color of your skin, you won't have the opportunities as everyone else. So to even get close to getting those opportunities, you have to be twice as good as your competition, right? You cannot be average. A C for a black kid won't cut it, right? You need to be in AP English getting straight all A's, right? That's the only way to get yourself in the conversation of having opportunities, right? 
So that's a funds of knowledge, that's a folklore that gets passed down within the Black community to help us make, make sense of the world and help us to situate ourselves in a way that we're successful, right? Um, I'm sure in the indigenous community, there's folklores and there's funds of knowledge that gets passed down to help you guys make sense of the world and help you maintain your place in the world, right? So what Chris is talking about is the sustaining of culture. And these folklores and these funds of knowledge are weapons to sustain culture and to ward off the onslaught of deculturation. Does everybody know what, I, what that means when I say deculturation? What, what does that mean, Eileen? Deculturation, like, like the deculturation, like, I mean, I'm not, based on like what I've been reading and stuff like that, I feel like it's like trying to like, like break it apart, like how like indigenous, like when they came here, like they were trying to get rid of their culture. Yes. So like they're deculturizing it, like yes. getting, making them trying to forget it or. Forget it, yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly what deculturation is. So again, folklore and funds of knowledge become a weapon against deculturation, right? Um, Chris, were you, was that all from your group or did you guys have more that you wanted to contribute? No, uh, there wasn't that much discussion in our group. It was just me and someone else. Okay. Um, who else was is in, whoever else was in Chris's group? Did you want to comment or add on to that? Um, yeah. One other thing we talked about semi was like the style, and what I brought up was that the style seemed like uh, the way she was conveying her the story was very informal, based on what we've been reading for the past couple of weeks. I've been very formal. And I think Christopher was saying that um, the past couple of weeks used a lot of uh, very, uh, what's the word? Big language, not big language, but. The academic you know, language, big yeah. words, yeah. Big words, yeah, compared to her, where it was more like you were having a conversation with someone instead of reading someone's like work. Yeah. Which kind of made it a bit easier to understand. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, so you guys would say then that the, her method was effective? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, good point. Um, so our last group um, was group one. Alyssa was in the group. I don't know if she's a spokesperson, but if you guys have signed a spokesperson for that group, um, go ahead for group one. Um, in our group, we talked a lot about folk, folk, folklore. And we're throwing out I, uh, all these ideas and stuff like that. Personally, I, I was thinking about like folk people, which was wrong. <laughs> but we ended up coming to this like idea of like the what you mentioned before about the turtle and the rabbit and like slow and steady wins the race. And we just built on about that, about fol like folklore stories that lead a teaching like the turtle and the rabbit, slow and steady wins the race. That that was like our main point that we kept on coming back to. Yeah. And we we're just building around upon that. And we said that like teachings like today can be passed down. Like I'm gonna throw out this example. Like my mom teaches me, uh, treat people how you want to be treated. Like I guess that can be a folk, like a folklore that she teaches me. And we we're just trying to come up with ideas and how it can come up, like relate to today. And another idea was what you said about how black people have to be twice as better so they can stand out in today's world, make a difference. And we were building on about that. And the reading, we, were, we found the reading kind of difficult to understand because it was so relaxed yeah. and it was a conversation. And the stories just like, they weren't, well, tying into what uh, group two said, they weren't formal, they were informal. So it kind of made it difficult to understand for me personally. And we didn't like really grab the, the main idea of them, uh, of the, the correct way to eat fish and like you warm, your, like, warm yourself up. It was, it was confusing at best <laughs> okay so so you guys said it's opaque it's a little bit opaque still it wasn't made as clear as you had wanted to be um 
that's a, that's a really good point, Ariane, because I, I felt reading it initially, I felt the same way. Um, how many of y'all read it out loud when you read it? Kind of. It has a, it has a different effect when you read it out loud. And, and to me, for me, I had to read it out loud to make it make sense. And, and I had to like, so like I lived in, in Tennessee for like a semester, right? I went to school in Tennessee. And um, the time that I was there was an adjustment for me because everybody says like, you know, being in California, you don't think you have an accent, right? Like you just, we talk the way that we talk, no big deal. But when you go down South, them motherfuckers, they talk like this, right? So a lot of people, I, I, I couldn't even understand half the time what people were saying, right? But that experience helped me make sense of what I was reading here. I'm also reading a lot of um, enslavement narratives. A good portion of the texts are read, written in that fashion, also very informal. Um, so yes, it does become confusing. You kind of have to train your brain to interpret things a different way. It's almost like reading another language. Um, one of the parts where he says covers, the way that they spelt covered, I'm like, bro, what the fuck are you talking about? But when you read it out loud, you know he's talking about a cover, right? Um, so yes, it, it can be confusing, but at the same time, I agree with Cassandra in the fact that when you think about it from the standpoint of method, right, it, it makes sense. Because if she's going to New Orleans and she's going to these real remote southern parts of Florida, they don't talk academic. Right. They're not going to talk theories. They're not going to talk about, you know, these high class social things. That's not their conversation. So you really can't translate what she heard into an academic language. Right. And, and, I, and if you think about Maladoma Patrice May and the difficulty that he had writing his, his um, autobiography, the same difficulty plays out in this work in the sense that Zornel Hurston can't use academic language to articulate the happenings of Southern culture, right? It, it, it just won't work, it won't translate. So it has to be produced in a way that she captured it, right? And another thing is like, although the stories that is dealt with and the content that the characters are telling are fables, these people are, are real people. Like these, these are real characters, these are real conversations that happen. This is an anthropological study, right? So she literally took her notebook, she took her car, she drove down to Florida, and she sat in these spaces and listened to these stories and jotted down notes. And that is what produced this book, right? So you have to kind of keep that in mind as well. It's like when, when, when she's cultivating this production, it has to come out this way because she wants to keep the authenticity of what she's observing, right? Um, have you guys done any research or familiar with at all the science of, of anthropology? So, to put it non-politically, they call it the study of people, right? If you were to break down what anthropology is, it's just the study of people. But the way that it plays out in a colonial world, and if you take into power account, is typically the Western world um, or the first world countries, right? Europe, United States, certain parts of Asia, right? The first world will go into these third world countries, Africa, other parts of Asia, certain parts of South America, right? And they'll make studies of these individuals. They don't, they're not from those communities, they're not from those cultures, but they'll take what they think they know about the culture, observe the culture, and try to make sense of what that culture is doing and what their, their important um, symbols and significant activities are, right? But again, they have no real context or understanding of these cultures, right? So that's typically how anthropology plays out. Um, have you guys heard of um, eugenics, the eugenics movement? So the eugenics movement is the science that says um, because of the size of someone's brain, they may be smarter than someone else, right? Eugenics movement says that um, Anglo-Europeans are smarter than um, Asians, who are smarter than um, indigenous peoples, who are smarter than Negro people or Negroid people or Black folks, right? This is um, it's the whole thought that has, or whole science that has been produced to justify racist activity, right? So. Anthropology is birthed out of this science, eugenics, right? 
So what Zernel Hurston is able to do is not view the community from an outsider, right? So she's not going into a community that she's unfamiliar with, where she does not understand the customs, the cultures, the nuances. She's from these communities. So this place in Florida that she's visiting, that's her hometown. So she's essentially going back to her hometown to observe her hometown, to study the folklore. Because her research interest in college is African American and Caribbean folklore. That's what she studied. That was her uh, dissertation, her thesis, thesis was on. So she returned home to study the folklore of her people, right? So in her doing so, she wants to produce a production that is authentic as possible to the people who she's studying, right? She doesn't want to do it in the way that typical anthropologists do and make half-ass assumptions about the people who she's studying, right? So when you think, when you take all that into consideration and you think about her method, then it makes a little bit more sense as to why it's written in the way that it's written, although it's opaque, right? Although it becomes confusing for the reader at times, right? Although if you don't have any um, experience with Southern Black culture, all of this seems like a foreign language, right? But it becomes important to produce it that way so it remains and it keeps its authenticity. Also, think about it in this regard. Think about what we read last week with Ngugi, right? or not sorry, now two weeks ago with Ngugi, right? The question of whose culture has value, right? I'm at a conference for African writers who only speak English language, right? So we're devaluing a certain culture because we only want to hear English, right? So what Zornel Hurston is saying, nah, fuck that. You're not about to devalue my culture. I'm going to make you guys come to me, right? So if you want to read this and you want to learn, you're going to have to go through the labor and go through the work of interpreting my culture, right? I'm not going to meet you in the middle. You're going to have to come to meet us where we're at, right? So that's also a move at play within Zornel Hurston's method, right? Um, let's see. Any other thoughts, questions, concerns on the book or on the reading? Um, Andrea, Esperanza, Chelsea, we have Emily, we haven't heard from you guys today. Can I say something? Yeah, please. Oh, okay, sure. So um, I just want to say, like, even though, like, I understood her method, like, it worked and everything, but I felt the the reading was random. Like, I understand. I understood the basic uh, teachings or like the morals or not moral or yeah, I guess of each story individually, but I didn't understand how they all tied together as a whole. Like, what was the point of like, I don't know. It just, it, it all seemed random. And she just like put a whole bunch of tales together. I was like, here you go. And like, yeah, yeah um, you're, you're absolutely right, Alyssa. Um, that, that that's a flawless critique you're making, right? It's, so if I were to ask you, what is the thesis of what you read? To be real, there is no thesis in, 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 that, in those readings. Maybe each parable has a thesis on its own, but collectively, there is no collective thesis. Yeah, because like for the journal, I don't know. I didn't, I was like, I don't know the message. Like, I don't get what she's trying to say. Like, I don't get it. Yeah, and, and that's fair. Um, and then it's a little bit different reading the entire book opposed to just a portion of the book, right? Because in the first chapter, the first chapter is really is a chapter on method. She's explaining what I'm doing, how I'm going about what I'm doing. Um, so a lot of that question that you have, they don't appear because you read that initial chapter on why and the how. So it's like, okay, I, I get what you're doing. And then also think about, um, shit, you've been to a barbershop, you've been to a house party, you know what I'm saying? If you were to put all the conversations that you came across in a house party, how random would that sound, right? Like you, you've heard, you sat in three separate conversations. They're not all going to be symmetrical, right? So that's also in play. Um, but to me, if I were to think about a commonality of the stories, the commonality that I find is they're, um, they all help you make sense of something, right? Because we have a, a story about power right? Um, with the bear, the lion, and the, and the man. Um, we have a story about manners, right? 
about how to how to self care, how to take care of yourself, how to be cold, how to be warm, right? How to how to manage your your um, your state of being, right? And then we have the preacher with the with a, essentially it's a creation story, right? So they're all explaining of ways to be in the world from three different categories, right? The story, the preacher story is how the world came to be, right? How women are supposed to be aside, beside your man, not at the foot of the man, not at the head of the man, they're supposed to be beside your man. So think about even from that story, what led, what was prior to that story were them arguing about men and women fighting, right? So if you think about even that connection, they're having a dialogue about men and women fighting each other, but then it leads into a conversation of a preacher preaching a sermon about the role of the women, right? So those are threads that can tie those two stories together. But I think overall, this folklore is designed to help you understand and make sense of the world that you can't understand, right? And especially becomes important when the mechanisms that were in place to help you make sense of the world have been stolen from you, right? Because if you think about the enslaved experience, right? There was a whole community that helped you understand women's role, right? There's a rites of passage and initiation that you went through. Not only the women went through, but the men went through as well to understand that dynamic, right? But that was dis disrupted because of the process of enslavement, right? Um, there was a whole story of creation that African people had but that was disrupted because of enslavement. It, it broke up that process, right? Um, there's a way to, so there's this book called The Akan Protocol. And the whole book, is, it shows you how to, when you go to Akan regions, which is in Ghana, how when you visit, whose hand you should shake first, when you should sit down, when you should eat, right? So there's a whole science that goes behind that in the African context, but, that, but we were ripped from that science. So we have to make folklore up to fill that void. So although, albeit those stories may be random, but their design and the commonality in those stories are designed to help you make sense of the world or to help your place in the world make a little more sense. So you're absolutely right, Alyssa, like the, the shit don't make sense in a certain degree, but you have to take the context of who we're studying into consideration and one, what she's up to, which you guys didn't have because you haven't read the whole book. So that's unfair to expect that. But, you know, once you kind of have those little breadcrumbs of information, then the totality of the book makes a little bit more sense. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question, kind of? It's really not a question. It's a, it's a fair statement. And you're, you're absolutely right. Um, Andrea Esperanza, Chelsea, Emily, let's hear from at least two of y'all and we'll call it a day. I guess I'll, I'll say it. Um, I kind of was a little confused on the reading, so I had to just like reread it over and over. And I guess like on the third time, I started to finally like slowly understand what she was saying. It's like, it took me all this time to just like finally get all those like morals and like basically what we were talking about, like all the lessons that they had to like learn and everything. Yeah, I um I read it last night. Well, I mean, I read the book already, but I read it again last night to prepare, prepare for today. And then like an hour before class started, I read it again just so it could be a little bit more clearer and fresh in my mind. But you're right. And a lot of these works, you're going to have to read a couple times, you know, um, especially like Glissant. That's nothing you could just read once and then you, you got it, right? Um, when you talk about poetics, and that's kind of why I structured the readings the way that I did. Because to me, reading the Glissant kind of trains your mind to be a little bit more expanded and, and not so rigid in your reading. And then that way, this is a little bit more of a, a easier read, for lack of a better word, um, for you. So yeah. Um, Esperanza, and Chelsea, Emily, Nicoyo, Coco. Let's hear from one, more, one of y'all and we'll call it a day. Again, we have Emily Alcone, we have Chelsea Alvarez, we have Esperanza <laughs> Garcia, and Yoko Hernandez. We'll hear from one of you guys and we'll call it a day. I was gonna say, 
Um, I think I like most people said this this reading was in a sense harder, although it was a little more simplistically you could say written. It's just the accent that threw us that threw us off because you had to read it a lot of times to understand what um the reading was saying, and then that combined with the fact that like it's come, it's made up of a lot of stories, not just one. So like you're thrown from one one um uh st a story that they're saying, and then you're thrown to a different one. It it kind of throws you a little bit off, and like you're saying um. There's not really a thesis for the whole thing in completion. Um, you can find something um, in each of the stories, but if you try to find like an overall message that the author wanted to give, I don't think it's easy to find one. Um, but yeah. yeah. All right, so check it. Um, going forward, the one adjustment that I made for our midterm, um, I think I mentioned last week that after this course would be our midterm, I'm going to adjust that. Uh, we're, next week, we're gonna read James Baldwin. Um, and it's, a, it's another story, it's not as opaque as this one. Um, it's just a little bit more formal, um, but not as poetic as Glee Song. So I think you guys should be able to digest this a little bit more. Um, a little bit longer, so give yourself some time to read through it, but it's one of those straightforward stories. Um, but after we cover Baldwin, um, we were supposed to do Toni Morrison. Um, I'm going to counsel Toni Morrison. We're not going to do that. We'll do our midterm prep review. And then um, I'll assign the midterm. So we'll cover Baldwin next week. We're going to scratch Toni Morrison following that, and we'll do the midterm instead. Again, the midterm will be five questions. You're only responsible for three questions. Um, but you have to use a theoretical framework in answering each of your questions. Um, we will do a midterm review, uh, so that way you have all of this information fresh in your head. But again, just so we're clear, uh, we're reading James Baldwin, Go Tell It on the Mountain. I think it's Go Tell It on the Mountain. Let me, let me double check. One second. Okay, excuse me. No, it's not Go Tell Him Out. Uh, it's Going to Meet the Man is the essay that we're reading. Um, so it's an essay from the book, Going to Meet the Man, which is a collection of stories. So that's what we're reading next week from James Baldwin, Going to Meet the Man. Um, on your Google Classroom site is broken into three parts. It's all one story, though. It's only broken up like that because that's the way I had to scan it. So you only need one journal for next week's readings. So you don't need three separate journals, just one journal for all three of those readings. Um, as James Baldwin's going to meet the man, we'll discuss that next week. The following week, we'll do our midterm review. And that's when your journals are also due, okay? Um, is there any other questions, comments, or concerns you guys have for me? Nope. All right, if anything pops up throughout the week, just shoot me an email. Um, other than that, you guys have...